Hope this morning's passage is considered one of the most uh, misunderstood passages in the Bible. Uh, to prepare it, I uh, listened and, uh, and, uh, to three different Jewish rabbis and their uh, in, in impression on this passage because this passage has very strong links to who Jesus is. And I was just intrigued how the rabbis dealt with that. I then uh, considered a number of wide range of other religious uh, and Christian backgrounds to how they view this passage. Now, Daniel 9 is a passage that has been very much misunderstood with many of the writers on this passage telling me more about their presuppositions than about the passage. So what does it mean for us as believers? Now, as a believer, we need Scripture to speak for itself. That's the first thing. And secondly, we need Scripture to interpret Scripture. And obviously, uh, the last one is that what is obvious and clear in Scripture is used to interpret that which is obscure. So let's come now to this very, very controversial passage. And uh, this passage is some key teaching for Daniel's time, but also very strongly key teaching for you and I today. So the first question we need to ask is, when was it? Now, some of the chapters in the book of Daniel are not in the uh, chronological order. They don't follow year by year. For example, uh, Daniel 7 occurs uh, chronologically before Daniel 6. Now, the prayer we've got here in Daniel 9 by Daniel occurs in the same year that Daniel was sent to the lion's den. Now imagine if you'd gone to the lion's den and you survived, how would that have impacted the prayers that you prayed? Now this story of Daniel 9 occurs about uh, 538 BC. Uh, Daniel has hit a point where he realises that there was a prophecy in the book of Jeremiah saying in 70 years, those who have gone to exile will start returning. And so this deeply impacted his prayer. Now, it's interesting, the, uh, the Bible reading I picked for the New Testament was John 17, which was Jesus' prayer on the night that he died, uh, the night before he died on the cross. A very, very powerful prayer that captured the same depth that Daniel captures here. So we see there that uh, says that Daniel perceived in the books the number of years that, according to Jeremiah, must pass. Um, uh, and said that uh, it was 70 years, and they were very close to that 70-year period coming to an end now, he realised that there was nothing that he could do to bring about the Jews' release. He knew that the Jews' release was 100% in the hand of God. One of the interesting things I find, I, I love sharing the gospel. I know that um, I've been called to be an evangelist. But I'm also deeply, deeply aware that nobody comes a Christian unless the Holy Spirit convicts them. If it was my public speaking skills that converted them, then it's eloquence, not the spirit that converts. If it's the excitement, the humour and the energy I have in my sermons, then it's entertainment, not the Holy Spirit that convicts. And there's a conscious sense that we as a church need to say, our church is the one that God has planted and God will call people into the life of our church by the Holy Spirit convicting them to be. So let's look at the beginning of Daniel's prayer here in chapter 9, verse 3. Daniel says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God. Now for him, when he says he turned his face, he would normally open his window and he would literally face towards Jerusalem. Uh, that was a, a common thing. Matter of fact, the, the early Muslims used to all pray towards Jerusalem. As many, many years after Muslims uh, uh, became powerful, they swapped from praying towards Jerusalem to praying towards Mecca. So I turned my face towards the Lord God. Seeking him in prayer. Now, one of the words he used says, There was pleas for mercy with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. They're deep prayers of repentance, not just for himself, because he's a very godly man, but prayers of repentance for his friends, his outer circle, and all Jews that were in exile and those who are still back in the land. He says, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying this. And the first part here describes God. O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Why does he want to remind God that he's loving? Because the nation of Israel needed to be faced with judgment. When it comes to some issues, I pray, dear God, bring me righteousness and justice. But when it comes to my sins, I pray, dear God, bring me mercy. Because if God gave me justice, I would uh, face condemnation. 
Now, what was the problem that Daniel knew that they faced there in verse 5? We have sinned and done wrong, acted wickedly and rebelled and turned aside from your commands and your rules. We have not listened to your servants and the prophets. There's a really strong sense that he could see that his people had strayed. And he really struggled thinking, don't you know that you should love God? Why are you holding God at such a distance? And it reminds me of their responsibility there in verse 7. To you, our Lord, belongs righteousness, for to us is open shame. He was deeply aware how bad they were. As at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you. Daniel was very conscious of the failure of his brothers and sisters in God. Let's consider some of the concerns and concepts that Daniel had. The first thing is that Daniel knew very powerfully that uh, from the time of Abraham that God had set apart the nation of Israel to be his own people for a glorious purpose. Secondly, (coughs) Daniel knew exactly why they were in Babylon. He knew exactly the sins they had committed that had brought them into uh, disrespect and disgrace. Thirdly, Daniel knew that Israel's deliverance needed to be totally an act of God. There was nothing that he could do. There was nothing the nation of Israel could do to bring about their own safety. It had to be a God-ordained event. God knew, uh, fourthly, Daniel knew that God kept watch. That he would not forget his promise to free his people from captivity. Fifthly, Daniel knew that God had set a date. 536 to 535 BC was the 70th year of their captivity. And on that date, people would start being released. The sixth thing is that Daniel believed that he'd been placed into a high administration position in the uh, empire to help facilitate the removal of his people. Now it's interesting, wherever you are work-wise, God has placed you there for a purpose. Whether it be the lowest job or the highest job in the land, God places us to be his people, God's people in God's land under God's rule. Let's turn back to Daniel chapter 9. There in verse 11, it says that all Israel had transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that was written in the law of Moses. So when it says that um, he knew about the curse, where in the book of, uh, of the first five books by Moses do we find this curse? It's in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 14. And I'm just going to pick some of the verses out. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, then this is what I will do to you. I'll bring you on sudden terror, wasting diseases, fever will destroy your sight and sap your strength. Then verse 21. If you remain hostile towards me and refuse to listen to me, I'll multiply your afflictions seven times over as your sin deserves. 23. If, we, in, if in spite of these things you do not accept my correction but continue to be hostile towards me, I myself will be hostile towards you and will afflict you with your sins seven times over. I'll turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries. Of course, what's that describing? The nation of Israel going into... Um, to Babylon and the temple being destroyed. But if they confess their sins and their sins of their answers, I remember my covenant with you. And so these are the verses that uh, Daniel had taken very closely to heart. And the Bible very clear, follow me, I'll look after you, reject me, and things will fall apart. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 16. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. It goes on to verse 18. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city that is called by your name. <coughs> For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Daniel was falling in tears before God, in fasting before God, with a passionate desire saying, I want my people to return to you. 
He goes in verse 19, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for our own sake. My God, because your city and your people are called by your name. There's a deep, passionate call here of David to pray for his country. The same that you and I should be praying for Australia, praying for our leaders. At the moment, we've got a man who declares himself a Christian as Prime Minister. And I imagine nearly every single person has an opinion about how godly he really is. There's a whole lot of Christians who are saying, Does he, is he really a Christian? How can he allow this law to happen? And regularly the law they're saying allowing to happen is not one that he's passed, but one that he's inherited from past governments. And it's interesting, um, I look at people like Donald Trump and I'm thinking, uh, the amount of bit, bit of venom that is uh, given against that man. And it's not against his policies, it's against him as a person. So we need to uphold those who are Christians in politics. We need to uphold those who are Christians in, the, in positions of power and authority. Now the next part of Daniel changes because you have the, the, uh, um, the angel Gabriel appears. So there in chapter 9, verse 20. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, while I was speaking in prayer, Gabriel appeared. He said, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. In other words, God is saying to Daniel, you are special, you are precious, and the prayers you're praying are the right prayers for any godly man to be saying. Then verse 23, at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. I've come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And now a vision is given, and I'm happy that Daniel could understand it, because nearly every commentator since it has not understood it. But uh, it is about prophecy. Now I've read uh, many great and many worthy uh, theologians, and men that I deeply admire, and they all came up to significantly different opinions on this passage. And I realised one of the troubles is, that um, you don't use a microscope to look at stars. You use a telescope. Because that same microscope, some of the most difficult parts of these verses, they forgot what was the big picture. So let's take three or four steps back from this passage. Not to, rather than try and work out the nitty gritty of 70 weeks and three weeks and two weeks and all those type of things. What's the first thing it's telling us? The next part that's a vision says, Jesus will come to earth. So there in chapter 9, 24, there's a prophecy that says it'd be a finish to transgressions. In other words, it'd be an end to sin, to put an end to sin. There'd be an atonement for iniquity. In other words, your sins will be forgiven. You will have the bringing about of everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and profit to anoint a most holy place. That's the first thing. The passage clearly says at some time in the future, Jesus will come and redeem the world. And many Christians have captured that uh, and, uh, and seen the power of that. The second part is, is one of destruction. Like Daniel had seen the destruction already on the temple. He'd already seen the destruction on Jerusalem. But the prophecy here in chapter 9, verse 26, says that this destruction will come a second time. It says in 9, 26, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city. What city? Jerusalem. And the sanctuary, which is the temple. Its end shall come like a flood. It's not just going to happen like a whimper, but it's going to be a powerful event when the temple is destroyed, which we know is in AD 70. So where is the conflict? Why is this such a controversial passage? Going back to 9.24, it says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. Then verse 25, a prince that shall be for seven weeks... Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half of a week. And people have had an absolute field day trying to work out the 70 weeks. So there's a couple of different camps. One camp says each of the weeks represents years, not weeks. So we're talking about 490 years from when Daniel lived. And depending on what event you pick around Daniel's time, you either end up with something like AD 33, so you say, oh, look, it prophesied Jesus starting his ministry, or his death on the cross. If it's AD 30, it's the start of his ministry. 
It was AD 34. Oh, this is a year after Jesus died on the cross and after Pentecost and the church has given judgment to Jerusalem. And they all sound great, great and fine until you realise that they're all based on sand, not on rock. Now, others see the weeks as being weeks. And so they try and pick dates and events of things happening around Daniel's time and say, oh, it was fulfilled in this event or that event or that event. So others will try and pick something. Now, what do we know from all these pickings and choosings? Two key days come out. AD 33, Jesus <coughs> dies. AD 70, the temple is destroyed. The other two things this passage wants to get across to us, the, um, the, 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 the foreboding of judgment and the blessing of salvation. Now, some will look at the dates and the years and say, oh, the Jewish uh, prophets only had 360 days in their year, not 365. And so that changes all their mathematics again to try and juggle it, to squeeze it to fit some date they want it to fit. Now, the problem with that is that uh, Israel is an agricultural society. And if, you have, uh, uh, if you're out by five days a year, it doesn't take long that all your crops are being planted at the wrong time of season. Agricultural people knew the 365. And what they used to do was, yes, they had a 360-day year, and then they'd have the last section of that year, they'd kind of fill it in with the dates necessary to get it to 365. And so that was like a given for everybody. But there are people who want to try and twist things around. What do we need to be careful of? Never let the obscure become the importance of the message. Now, this passage is about repentance. It's about restoration. It's about the birth of Christ and the judgment on Jerusalem. Some very, very powerful themes. And these themes were left out of so many of the sermons that I read uh, in preparation for this sermon. And they left what was most important for that which was obscure. Why? Because they thought they were bright enough to know what the 70 weeks meant. Now, I could have given you a sermon this morning about a whole lot of maps and drawings and diagrams about what I thought was the, the real 70 weeks. But it would be my opinion, I'm preaching not God's word. I think there's enough obvious things to preach on without trying to pretend that I know all the obscure. So what's the first thing it says about Jesus? He's come there in chapter 9, verse 24, to finish transgression. In other words, to bring about forgiveness of sin and to bring about atonement. And I've just grabbed a couple of verses from the New Testament that show you the power of what Daniel was speaking about. So there in 1 Corinthians 15. For I have delivered to you as of first importance what I have received. In other words, this is the most important thing you're going to hear today. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Christ died for our sins according to Daniel 9. Then in 1 Peter 3. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring to us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. Or in Romans, there's three verses I picked from Romans, from Romans chapter 5. For God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> this is something that would have brought great joy to Daniel, because it's saying, I know how bad you are. I know the struggles you face. I know your difficulties, but I forgive all. Then in Romans 8, uh, 5, 8, uh, 5, 10. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Then Romans 5, 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. As Daniel receives his prophecy, there's a sense of saying, I know that you are helpless, but I have picked the right time. When Jesus will come and bring about the salvation that you want. He goes on to say that to seal both the vision and the prophet. In other words, that uh, what Daniel was going to say, Jesus would bring completion to. And as you go through the four Gospels, you have statements like this, like in Matthew one twenty two. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophets. And that statement is there time and time again. So in Matthew 8, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases. And when the early church started preaching Christ, what did they say? They're in Acts 3.18. For the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And so there's this really tr true sense. 
the word of Daniel looked in vision to the future, the New Testament brings out its reality for us. It then goes on to say this about anointing, to anoint a most holy place. Now, in the Old Testament, anointing was for prophets, for priests, for kings, uh, for special uh, parts of the temple. Uh, They were seen as uh, being anointed by the oil. In other words, they were set apart in holiness to be used by God. So what does it say about anointing for you and I as believers? 1 John 2.20 For you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Then 27 As for you, the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. In other words, God has poured His oil on us to keep us as special. And you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as His anointing teaches you all things, and is true and not a lie, and just as he taught you, you abide in me. God is the one who's the author of our salvation. God is the one who holds on to us in our struggles. God is the one who keeps us holy. Now what do we find happened here? The temple fulfilled because when Jesus died upon the cross, it says the curtain in the Holy of Holies was split from top to bottom. In other words, God did the splitting opened the way for all people to come in personal relationship with God. The sacrifice is obsolete. The temple is obsolete. The sacred days of uh, Jewish calendars are now obsolete. The uh, the priests and the Levites and their beautiful uh, outfits, totally obsolete. We have no need for them because now you and I are temple of the Holy Spirit. We are God's chosen vessels that he's chosen his Holy Spirit to dwell in. Secondly, we're told the temple was destroyed, that a new era had come. What does this passage teach us? It reminds us how you and I should pray, that we should be prayerful like Daniel, that we hold on to God's godliness with a sense of repentance and restoration and transformation. We also need to be, as Daniel was, to trust God Because when Daniel is praying these prayers and has this vision, he's in exile. He's in Babylon. He's probably in his 80s. He's lived the whole of his life not in the promised land. But most importantly, this passage reminds you and I that God is in control in the worst of situations. And in the midst of our hardship, he holds tightly to us because he knows he has a better way. Let's finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, may we always pray like Daniel. Father, bring us to repentance for the things we've done wrong. Teach us faithfulness by your Holy Spirit. That we may always trust you and have confidence in you because you are sovereign Lord. You are in control. Amen.